Hi, my name is Donna Bukowski. I currently serve in the nursery, otherwise known as the Wonder Station. I serve because it's a true joy to work around babies and toddlers. They're so fun. Um, they're usually much easier to talk to than adults. I want to do this for many reasons. Children this age, they need to be loved and cared for at all times. They need to feel welcomed so they can relax and have fun. But this in turn helps the parents of the young children relax and be able to enjoy God's Word so they can get the recharge they need in order to help them throughout the week because everybody knows it's not easy with young kids. Every action you do in ministry or not, when you do it with the right attitude, it is a ministry in itself. Whether it's cleaning floors, baking goodies, which again are really, really good, um, making coffee, singing, preaching, or feeding a baby a bottle. They're all ministries and can have life-changing impacts. My family struggled when the kids were very little going to church. The one we visited didn't have a nursery. And, and they were kids, just like that. Kids make noise, they move around. They're supposed to. It was very difficult when we ended up leaving many services to the point of not going back for a while due to the difficulty with the kids during the service. When we came to Epiphany, the nursery workers, they helped me so much and my husband that we were finally able to sit through full services so we could learn and grow and hear God's word. Now I'm honored to be able to serve and play with the kids to better help our parents today. People who should consider serving in the ministry for a nursery would be people who would like to play with kids, play with toys, and cuddle and be reliable and have lots of love to give. It's a lot of fun in nursery and the kids have just as much fun. I think the workers may have a little bit more fun too. So I just strongly recommend it. This is Donna Rubikowski and my ministry. It's so awesome to hear from Donna today. Um, my ministries are just a way that people can highlight how they are serving in the community um, and also in the church. And so if anything Donna said today tugged on your heart or, or you feel like you might be interested in helping out in the nursery, you can find her today and touch base with her or you can also mark it on your connection card and someone will get a hold of you. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Millie Westerman and I am um, on staff here at Epiphany Station. As Maddie said, you guys are joining us in week one of a sermon series called Like a Child. It's really exciting um, to go through this because as Christians, sometimes we want to know how we're doing in our faith. We want to know, are we doing what God calls us to do? Are we living to the standard that he has for us to live to? How are we doing in our faith walk? And for people that don't yet have a relationship with Jesus, it's a great opportunity to hear what God expects of us as his children. And so um, the scripture for this series actually comes from the book of Matthew. And to give you a little bit of background, there's two of Jesus' disciples, which are the, the people that were working closely with him and following him and being trained by him, walking down the road together and saying to each other, I think I'm doing this right. I think you're doing that right. And basically they come up to Jesus and they said, okay, who's really doing it right? Who's really doing what you want? What do we have to do to be the greatest? And so if we look at Matthew 18, verse 1, it says, At about that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called the little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's so amazing to me that God's kingdom is the exact opposite of what the world says. So the world tells us that we have to be powerful. We have to have money. We have to have position and authority in order to be great. But God tells us that in order to be great in his kingdom, we have to be humble. We have to think of ourselves like children and be willing to turn from our sin. Humility is defined as having the right view of one's own importance and ability. So during this series, we're going to take a look at why God says that we need to be humble and why we should become like a child. 
Today we're going to talk about the wonder of God's love for us, the wonder of his involvement in our lives. Next week we get to hear from Mary Seekert. <laughs> yeah, very excited about that. Uh, this will be her first time sharing at Epiphany Station, so you'll definitely want to be back to hear about that. She's going to share about the discovery of God and how we discover him for ourselves in our own lives and how that impacts us. And then the last week, we'll talk about the passion that God has put within each one of us and what he calls us to do with that passion. But all of it starts with wonder. And I, I just want to be clear. I'm not talking about wonder like, oh, I wonder what I should wear tomorrow or I wonder what I should make for supper. It's not wonder as in I'm just going to think about it and try to figure it out. No, it's mind-blowing, unfathomable, don't even understand what just happened, wonder. So uh, to give you an idea, I'll share a story of um, the, the first time that I probably saw this with my daughter. I saw the kind of wonder that we're talking about. Um, I have two daughters, that my two youngest, they're 12 months and six days apart in age. So basically for two years straight, I was pregnant. And my daughter, Emma, came to me and said, Mom, you were pregnant, and then the baby came out. And then you were pregnant again, and the baby came out. How does that even happen? And because I'm a nurse, I can't help but be scientific. And so I told her exactly what happened, and she looked at me and went, You mean it comes out of you? And I said, Yep. And she said, and you don't break in half? <laughs> That's the kind of wonder that we're talking about. Wonder that just blows your mind. Wonder that you can't quite grip, that you can't quite make sense of. That's what we're talking about. The kind of wonder we're talking about is, is to be filled with admiration, amazement, or awe. As we grow old, and as we experience life, many of us lose our wonder. We lose our wonder because we get hurt by the world. We get hurt by people that we know or we hurt ourselves. And that amazement at the world soon turns into distrust, soon turns into protecting ourselves. And that's why it's so important that we look at these verses because God is calling us to humble ourselves like children and to regain a sense of wonder at who he is and how much he loves us. The wonder that, that he is big enough to be in control of everything in the world, yet small enough to care about each one of us. We need this because if we don't believe that God is big enough to be in control, then who is in control? There are basically two lies that keep us from seeing God as he is. And uh, those are that he's not big enough to have control of the world, to have control of our lives, and that he's not small enough. And I want to just clarify right now, when I first heard this, I thought, oh, that's, that's strange, or almost that's disrespectful towards God to say that he's small. But if you give me just a couple minutes, I'll explain it so that, it, so that you can see that it's not disrespectful, it's just the way that we're viewing it. Our wrong view of God's bigness causes us to live in insecurity. Insecurity is the feeling that everything is a threat and no one is in control. This causes us to feel unsafe. And then we use things like emotional manipulation or addictions to feel in control, to feel like we have control of our life and our surroundings and ourselves. But the reality is that those things never work. They never give us true control. Instead, they just they just dig down deeper within us and reveal more and more the insecurity that we feel. They cause us to become more insecure. And shortly behind our trying to control and failing, we begin to struggle with feelings of anxiety and vulnerability and distrust as we learn that we aren't able to control. The second lie is that God is not small enough. And I'm not talking about size. I'm not talking about that he's too small to be involved in our lives. What I'm talking about is the lie that he's too small 
to be personally involved with us. That he's, that he's too big to actually care about me or about you. That's the lie that we believe. When we believe that God is too small to be involved in our lives and to love us and to care for us and to, and to be concerned with what's happening, this lie causes us to feel fear. Fear is the oldest emotion in the Bible. It's the first emotion mentioned after Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and sinned for the very first time. Then when he was walking in the garden, he heard God's voice. And the Bible says that he was filled with fear. Fear is based on the lie that we are all alone in dangerous waters. Fear tells us that nobody understands but I am alone. And this can cause us to do one of two things. The first thing that this fear can do is cause us to live a life of isolation. We never take any risks. We never get involved. We hunker down at home where we feel safe and live a life of loneliness. That's not how God created us to live. And the second thing it can do is it can cause us to be so afraid of not being loved by others, that we go above and beyond, that we become perfectionists, that we get addictions, all the things that we do to try to make ourselves feel loved or just to even cover that void of not feeling loved. One of the things that I've struggled with, and this is kind of embarrassing to share with you guys, but I will. If you know me well, then you probably already know this. But um, one of the things that I've struggled with as I become a Christian is um, one-upping. And, and so uh, someone told me that it's actually called Tommy Topping. <laughs> Anybody else heard that? No? Okay. Well, I'm the friend that you tell me, oh, I had such a bad day, this happened. And then I'd say, oh, yeah, well, this and this and this happened to me. And I'm the friend that would say, you know, someone would say, oh, I've got a gluten intolerance. And I'd say, oh, I've got a gluten intolerance and a dairy intolerance. And did you know that I, I can't sleep well? Just continuing to add more and more and more to prove my worth and my value by the things that have happened or the things that I've done. And it's kind of ridiculous, it's true, but that's something that I've struggled with all along. And so now, now that you guys all know my big secret, you can help hold me accountable. And if you see me one-upping, then you can tell me, you being a one-upper. God's worked in my life and he's bringing me more and more security so that I don't have to feel like I have to be better than other people, that I have to top what they did or what they experienced. Another thing that happens with fear is it comes to us on, on horizons of new things. When something new is about to happen, a lot of times we feel fear. And that is, that's why we call it the fear of the unknown. Right? The fear of the unknown. And the truth is that we're not really afraid of what we're going to do or, what, or what's going to happen. What we're afraid of is that we will be alone in that new place. That we will go into this unknown, uncontrolled situation and we will be all by ourselves. Some of the most painful lies that we can believe that get deeply embedded in us by the enemy and by the world are lies like God doesn't see what I'm going through. God doesn't care what I'm going through. I've messed up too much for him to still love me. But the truth is that God is big enough to handle everything in our lives and he's loving enough to get involved. He loves each one of us so much that he's willing to get involved in what's going on in our lives. What I find Uh, comforting is that God calls us as children. We can be secure in God's love when he calls us as children because we can't fail at being a son or daughter. No matter what you do, you can't fail out of that position because it doesn't have anything to do with what we do or what we say or how we act. It's who we are. One of the ways to combat the lie that God isn't big enough is to look back at what he's done. 
One of the examples that's really stuck out to me and helped me to understand the wonder of God's power and his might and his control over the world and over the people that are in control in the world is the example of when God freed the Israelites from Egypt. This family moved to Egypt and they were there for generations and generations and generations and they began to grow. And because they grew, the pharaoh or the king of that area became concerned. And so I'm going to kind of paraphrase what happened from the book of Exodus. You can follow along on the screen. Um, It won't be word for word though. From Exodus 1, starting at verse 7. The Israelites had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. Pharaoh said, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build cities. In my opinion, slavery is the most degrading form of control that anyone can experience. A slave doesn't get to decide where they will live, what they will eat, what they will do, or what's done to them. They are completely under the control of their master. And God, to show his control over the world and over the people that he cares for, performed 10 miraculous plagues on the Egyptian people to free the Israelites. If you haven't read the story of the Exodus before, I recommend you do. It will give you a mind-blowing understanding of what God has done and the power that he has. If you don't have a Bible that you um, can understand or you don't have one, we have Bibles out at the Next Step station that you can have for free. We would be glad for you to take one. God showed through his people that he was in control of their situation. They hadn't done anything wrong. All they were doing was living, and evil came and took over. And God, to show the wonder of his might and his strength, came with the ten plagues that could only be a result of the one true God. The ten plagues that he showed have never been done since then. They've only been done once before. Not only did he bring these plagues so that his people would be freed, but when the Egyptians finally said, okay, get out of here, we don't want you anymore, it's obvious that you have God's favor and that your God is in control and fighting for you, God led them by a pillar of a cloud during the day to show them this is the way to go and a pillar of fire by night so that they knew that they were following God. And when when everything seemed hopeless, when they were in between a rock and a hard place, they had the army of the enemy full of rage and anger, pursuing them, ready to overtake them and bring them back into bondage behind them. And they had the Red Sea in front of them. They were in a completely hopeless and powerless situation with no way around. But God in his power parted the Red Sea and made way for his people to get through. Many of us find ourselves in those situations now where we look at what's coming and we feel so helpless and there's nothing we can do to stop that. And we look at what's before us and it seems so impossible and so hopeless. But the wonder of our God is that he opens the seas and that he makes a way for us to come through. God was in control then and he's still in control now. And if that story isn't enough in its own to convince you, then look at the people that you know, people in your life right now that have been changed or helped by God. And you look at their life and who they used to be, and there's no way that they are who they are now on their own. Or you look at things that have happened, and you say there's no way that that could have happened on their own. And if you don't know anybody If you don't have a friend or a family member that comes to mind, then I would like to introduce you to me. (laughs) God has time and time again shown his control in my life. When he freed me from my drug and alcohol addiction, he freed me from the abuse of my childhood and made me who I am now. 
but one memory of a time when he helped me beyond anything I could have imagined is something I'd like to share with you today. Um, five years ago, my husband and I were separated, and we were headed for divorce. And at the time, my husband worked for our church, and we lived in the parsonage of the church as our payment, and he decided that he didn't want to work there anymore. And so he wasn't living with us, me and our kids, and I knew that we were going to have to leave. And so I started looking for apartments. I started looking for a place to live. And if you have looked for a place to live in the last five years at Epiphany Station, not at Epiphany Station, in Thief River Falls, then you know that there is nothing. It's so hard to find a decent apartment. It's so hard to find a place to live. And so I went to these apartments, and the apartment was crowded and dirty, and it wasn't going to work for our family. And I went home and I broke down and I started crying. And I said, God, I don't know what you want me to do here. I don't know how to get through this, God. I don't know how to, to find what we need to find. We've got to move and I have nowhere to go. I'm stuck, God. And I prayed and I said, Lord, I know that I'm being selfish, but God, please, please give me a garage so that I don't have to carry my babies out in the cold and so that the car can be in there. And God, if you could just give us a fence so that, so that my kids can play in the backyard and be safe. And Lord, the last thing I want to ask is that there would be enough room for our family. We need room, God. We can't, we can't scrunch into the place where, we, where I was looking. We need your help. And then I said, but whatever you want to do, God, is in your hands. And then like any good Christian, I flipped open my Bible and stuck my finger on a verse. And... Um, the verse that I pointed my finger on gave me hope that God was in control. And it was Psalm 31, 8. And it said, And you have not given me over to the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a large place. From that moment, I knew that God had spoken to me and that he was in control. Several weeks later, time kept going and I kept feeling more and more turmoil, more and more pressure. But I knew there was nothing I could do. A friend of mine told me of a friend of hers that rents out houses, and she said, you can call him. So I called and told him my situation and asked if he had any houses we could rent. And he said, well, I only have one house right now. It's vacant. It hasn't been cleaned yet. And I probably want to sell it. I don't really want to rent. But I guess you can check it out. And if it works, then you can stay there till you find something else. And so I met him at the house. And when I got there, the house had a garage, it had a fenced-in backyard, and it had enough bedrooms for our family. God was in control of that situation and of what I needed before I even knew that, that I needed it. He provided for me before I had even asked. God is big enough to control and small enough to care for us. Listen to the promise that he gave to his people Israel, which still stands for us today. Isaiah 43, 1 through 2 says, But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you, says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. God, our Father, knowing that the fear of being alone was paralyzing for us, sent his son Jesus to be with us, to heal us of our fear and of our insecurity. The book of Matthew, speaking about Jesus, who is soon to be born, says, Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is with us. God promises that we will never be alone. He promises that no matter what we go through, he will be there, and that he loves us deeply. Jaira Seekert is a young man who goes to our church who had a powerful experience 
with God's love. He experienced the wonder of what it means to be loved by God. And he made a my epiphany to share with us all. So let's take a look at what God did for him. Hi, I'm Jaira, I'm 10 years old, and my parents are Jim and Mary, and I have two sisters and one brother, and I love God. I've pretty much known God all my life, but a few years ago, something happened to me that really made me know how God loves us and how overwhelming it is. One night, me and my dad were spending time together, and it, my dad had to pause the movie for to explain to us. And then he went on t thanking God for me. And then I felt God's love through my dad. And then I just felt it everywhere. And I was thankful for everything. God's love was so overwhelming. I just, it's so hard to explain how overwhelming it is. And I really love God more. I'm Jairus Seeker, and this is my epiphany. Such an amazing testimony from a child of God's love. Jaira experienced God's love so powerfully that in his own words, he couldn't even explain it. God's love filled him and fell on him in a way that he had never experienced before. And he loves each of us just as much as he loves Jaira. And he desires to show each of us that love that he showed to Jaira. He took, Jesus took all of our fear and all of our aloneness to the cross when he died for us. And he was himself completely separated from God so that we would never have to be separated from God. And what's amazing is that his love isn't only for some uh, um, super holy religious elite group of people, but it's for everybody. God loves everybody. He desires to have a real relationship with each one of us. And he offers this to anyone who will be like the child from the verses in Matthew that will turn from their sin and humble themselves and come to him like a child full of wonder. The presence of God demonstrates his healing and his reassurance of his love. So when we feel lost in fear, Jesus finds us and is with us. When we feel rejected and worthless, Jesus accepts us and approves us. When we feel shame and insecurity, Jesus covers us and surrounds us. When we feel broken and hopeless, Jesus restores us and becomes our living hope. When we are dead in our sin, Jesus saves us. Hosea 6.3 says, Let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn. And he will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. Just like we can count on the sun rising each morning, we can count on the faithfulness of God. When we are dry and parched, when we're disconnected, and we're spiritually and emotionally dead, God will bring us life. God is ready and waiting to prove his faithfulness to us, to each one of us here. He's made a way and he wants to bring salvation to us. Those of, those of you sitting out here today that don't yet have a relationship with Jesus Christ, his desire is to come to know you, to free you from the bondage of your sin, and to give you life, to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, the light of his son. And for those of you that are out there that have already given your life to God, you've already submitted to God, he wants you to know that there is still more. There is still more to be had of him. There is still more to experience with him. He wants to strip away all of our insecurity, 
and all of our fear as we rest in his presence and give him control. As we look at this idea of wonder and what it means to be filled with awe at who God is, this God who brings us salvation, this God who's helping us to see him as he truly is, what do we do? Where do we go from here? At Epiphany Station, we like to have next steps. We want to challenge people to take a step on their faith journey. We don't want you to come here and just sit for an hour and then go and do nothing. We want you to take what you heard and what you learned and allow God to use it to change you and to move you in the direction he wants you to go. So for today, we have three next steps for you. The first is to wonder at God's bigness. The way that we do this is by looking back. Look back for God's fingerprints throughout history. In other people's lives, people that you know, look to see how God has moved and what he's done, and in your own life. I know that a lot of us here today are filled with pain and experiences that have changed us that we can't quite make sense of yet. And if you're in that situation, if you're looking back on things or you're currently in a situation that you're feeling like, God, where are you? Why is this happening? And you want help? You want help to see where God is and what he's doing? Please mark it on your connection card. Myself and the other staff members, we would love to get together with you and to talk and to pray and to seek God about where he is. Another thing I challenge you to do is to read the book of Exodus. This was mind-blowingly, eye-opening, crazy to me to think that God could do all these things, to think that God brought forth the plagues to free his people. But he didn't stop there. He allowed his presence to lead his people, and he parted the sea, and he continues to do those things for us now. The second step is to wonder at God's smallness. Jesus' death and resurrection and the gift of his ever-present spirit is the embodiment of his closeness. Jesus was speaking to his disciples before he ascended back into heaven, and he said in John 14, starting at verse 25, I am telling you these things now while I'm still with you. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. When we turn from our sin and we come humbly to Jesus for salvation, he gives us his spirit. I want to share an experience with you of when God showed me that his spirit was deeply involved in my life. Several years ago, I was looking back at some of the things that had happened, things that had hurt me and frustrated me. I didn't understand where God was. And I said to God, where were you when this happened? Didn't you care? Didn't you care what was happening to me? And God said, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. That means that my spirit lives within you. Everything you experienced, I experienced with you. Every pain that you felt, I felt with you. Every discouragement, disappointment, I felt with you. You are not alone. We are never alone. If God's spirit is dwelling within us, he is always with us. And although people may never understand what we've been through or what we're feeling or what we've experienced, God does. And he also understands and knows what the people we love are going through and experiencing and struggling with. And he loves them too. So my challenge to you today is to ask him. Ask him to help you see where he was. Ask him to help you see where he is, where he's working in your life or where he worked in the past. And I want to remind you, though, that God doesn't always answer how we think he should. He doesn't always do what we want. So, for instance, if you're struggling financially and you don't win the lottery, don't be surprised. That's probably not going to be the result. If you, if you do, let me know. 
but otherwise don't expect that. Expect that he will show you in a way that is intimate between the two of you where he was. It's not going to change the circumstance. It's not going to change what happened, but it will change our view of what happened because we will know that we weren't alone. The third thing we need to do is to humble ourselves, just like the child in our verses. Humble ourselves through confession and repentance. Remember, humility is having the right view of ourselves and our abilities. And so we need to come to God knowing that we are sinners, knowing that we do things wrong, that we can't do it right on our own, and that we need him to help us. It means that we have to admit that we need his forgiveness from our sin. Otherwise, we will carry the weight of our sin everywhere we go. Jesus is desiring to take it off of us. We need to come to him to learn how to live free from insecurity and fear. So today I ask you to consider humbling yourself and following the one true God. There are many gods in this world, but none of them are the one true God. If you're ready, if you're already a believer in Jesus Christ, ask him to show you that he is in control of your life. He is in control of the situations that you are experiencing and that you are not alone. Ask him to show you that. So we're gonna do the first part of this last step together, which is super scary, I know. Everyone's probably like, what? Um, (laughs) And by the crickets, I can tell that I'm right. Um, We are going to do something that I don't know if we've ever done at Epiphany Station before or not. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to pray together. And when I say pray together, I don't mean I'm going to pray for everyone, but we've got a prayer that's going to be on the screen, and we're all going to pray together. But I want to make something clear. Um, if If you feel today, you feel God's Spirit pulling on you, you feel Him tugging on your heart, and you're ready to make that commitment to him, you're ready to lay down your burdens, to lay down your sin and to pick up his grace and his forgiveness, then please pray with us. And if you're already a believer, please pray with us as we ask God to break us free from insecurity and fear. But if you're here today and you still don't know where you stand with God and you're not ready to make that commitment, then you don't have to pray. There's no pressure. Nobody's going to be looking at you, judging you. Everyone's going to be looking at themselves and filtering our hearts and our lives through the words that we say. So in just a minute, the words are going to be on the screen behind me. But I want to remind you guys as we do this that the result when we wonder at God's bigness and his smallness like children is that we break free from insecurity We break free from the lie that no one is in control. And we break free from fear, the lie that we are all alone in dangerous waters. We begin to trust God as a child trusts. So let's pray together. I'm going to sit so I'm not weird. Okay. God, we need your help to break free from insecurity and fear. Release us from the grip of bitterness, depression, addictions, loneliness, and isolation. We choose to turn from our sin today back to you. We know that you sent your son, Jesus, to pay for our sin and that you raised him from the dead so that we can live with you. We come humbly before you today in wonder at your love for us and ask for your forgiveness. When we are overcome by our circumstances, let us feel the security of your presence. When fear of the unknown rushes in, remind us of the truth that you have promised to be with us. Fill us with your spirit and show us how you are working in the world and in our lives. Jesus, it's in your name we pray.